Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Duke Koishi. And I'm Bill Spencer. In our show tonight, we'll cover the Tech Hui 2011 annual tech conference that took place last month at UH Manoa. Among other things, it featured a remarkable keynote by physicist Garrett Lisi on his geometric theory of everything and an Ignite program organized by High Capacity. The Tech Hui conference was organized to highlight interesting Hawaii-based people and organizations working in science, technology, and interactive design to facilitate education and networking in Hawaii's tech community and to help Hawaii technologists connect with global tech leaders. The keynote for the conference was delivered by physicist Garrett Lisi on his geometric theory of everything. So Garrett Lisi is a surfer from Maui. Um, <laughs> He is, he is also a preeminent theoretical physicist working on the holy grail of physics, which is to uh, come up with a, uh, to reconcile Einstein's theory of gravitation, of general relativity, with uh, Heisenberg's quantum mechanics. And as, as you all probably know, Einstein kind of moved us forward the most of anyone in terms of our understanding of the universe since Newton. And then uh, as a teenager during World War II, um, Heisenberg laid the foundation for quantum mechanics. And uh, we've, we've kind of had a, this problem that those two theories uh, haven't really been reconciled. And if you reconcile them, you get this sort of grand unification theory. There's been a lot of work in, uh, with other physicists in an area called string theory, which you've all probably heard of. Um, but uh, we all know that to, to make this work, there has to be some quantum leap in understanding and of, of the universe. And Garrett's come up with a disruptive theory and upset some other physicists. So I, I know he's doing the important work because if, if you're not upsetting anyone, then you're probably not doing anything interesting. So now I'll turn it over to Garrett to explain to us how the universe works. Thank you, Dan, very much for inviting me here uh, and giving me such a small task. <laughs> explain how the universe works. And also, for uh, since I woke up this morning on Maui, I want, have you to thank for being able to view this lovely uh, lunar eclipse we had this morning at 5 in the morning. <laughs> but uh, it was spectacular, so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was great to see. Yes, I would like to uh, do like, the best I can without too much math in describing how our universe works at uh, a fundamental level, uh, combining general relativity, uh, Einstein's description of gravity, with our understanding of particle physics. And I'll try to do that in a way that's uh, entirely geometric, and uh, even describe what that means to be geometric. So, as far as we know, at the smallest scales of the universe we've been able to probe, our universe consists of a seething froth of interacting elementary particles. These particles are careening about and interacting with each other according to the laws of quantum mechanics and particle physics. And these interactions are happening around us and in us and make us up all the time. Now, over the years, physicists have been able to look down to smaller and smaller scales to see what's going on and to figure out what the fundamental constituents of matter are. And to do this, we've used increasingly large machines to look down to smaller and smaller scales. Uh, this machine, which I had the great pleasure to visit just a few months ago, is a Large Hadron Collider in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Um, for the scale of this thing, this thing's five miles or 5.4 miles in diameter. Um, the detectors on this thing are absolutely enormous. That's a, that's a person down there to give you an idea of the scale of these detectors. Um, absolutely enormous. And what this thing is doing is accelerating protons in opposite directions around a ring and then bringing them in to collide as they're going in one of these detectors. And after this collision, there's so much energy in these protons that when they collide, they produce a spray of all sorts of other elementary particles. And these go out and trigger detectors. And we use computers to very quickly uh, analyze the collision and see what elementary particles were produced. And over and over, over the years, as accelerators have gotten more and more powerful, um, we've been able to see an entire zoo of elementary particles. These are particles that don't exist in ordinary matter. These are ones that you really need these enormous energies in order to produce. But by producing them, we start to see a larger and larger pattern of elementary particles that exist in the universe. And at this point, we've got a whole zoo of elementary particles that we know of. 
The Ignite program at the conference included Chai Ho Lee on designing for the screen, Nicole Horry on rediscover technology, Kevin Hughes on great examples of cross device design, Olin Lagan on how a local nonprofit engaged over 100,000 people with zero marketing dollars, Gorm Lai on global game jam, James Wang on software development communication, and April Young on 3D printing. All right, great examples of cross device design. Uh, basically, modern web designers and developers have to deal with an explosion of devices. Everything from netbooks to ebook readers to smartphones, beyond just the typical laptops and so on. And, and because of this, the emerging trend that we're seeing in the design industry is, is why don't we create one thing to work across many different types of devices and aspect ratios, where in the past we might have considered just a mobile device. The key thing is that now we're dealing with not just horizontal aspect ratios, but vertical aspect ratios, page layouts and formats. So you have to consider not just the left and right sides of the screen in your design, but also the bottom. You also have to take into consideration different hardware types, processing speeds. All right, so I'm James. I'm going to be talking about software development collaboration. And basically, um, uh, I want everyone to know that software developers need to be able to communicate with other people in order to become good software developers. And um, usually, people get into the field because uh, they're uh, introverted. So um, these are some details about me. I'm not a fob. I, I think I might be considered a fob, but I'm not. I'm definitely not the fresh part anymore. So uh, some of my interests. Uh, so who who likes software uh, development? I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, people that you know go into software development because they're introverted and they like to do stuff on their computer and they're you know this this is the kind of mess that they like to go through so it's kind of a strange group. So uh, it can get really complicated really quickly and uh, you know you know it comes up with stuff like this and you know what the hell you're doing because there's gonna be a lot of things uh, in your software project that's just a big mess you know over time. Okay so thank you everybody for coming out on a Saturday and the presentation today is going to be on 3D prototyping, its uses in art, future possibilities, and you know what it's going to apply to, to in today's world. So please bear with me. It's a bit of stuff to cover. But what is 3D printing? It's an additive process where you build up things in layers and create a shape as opposed to traditional methods of milling, which is a subtractive method, and creates a lot of waste and mess, and you really don't want to mess with that a lot of times. Um, this allows us to apply it to many different fields, uh, anything from architecture to art to mechanical design and many different things in between. Uh, a good example of this is in entertainment where they're using a lot of this stuff for props and uh, architecture to create sets and this allows them to be creative with it and say, no, this doesn't look right, let me change it and we'll come back in a few hours with a completely new design and it allows for really fast revisions as well as color, which is very fun. I thought um, I'd do a presentation on graphic design and sort of how graphic design and design might sort of help a technology project. And I thought I'd show a lot of examples from uh, my students because I think their work probably could be the most interesting. And most of the work I'm going to show you is actually undergrads and sort of beginning sophomore students, which I think is even more remarkable. So I guess we can start. Um, I actually come from a very traditional print uh, background. Uh, I work mostly in New York with uh, a lot of museums and advertising agencies uh, with a lot of cultural clients. So you can see a group of ads from a number of uh, kind of uh, programs I had set up. Um, I was fortunate enough to also do work that wasn't necessarily just print based, but sort of uh, environmental graphics, things that could actually sort of transform a space and something like, say, a Dolly show in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I also was a design director for the Aegis Society, and this is when we first started doing HTML coding and sort of creating all these web portals to access all the information and programming that they have. All right, so high capacity has been picking up a lot of steam in Hawaii. A lot of people are talking about us, and this is great because uh, people actually come up to me and they say, what exactly is a makerspace? And I have to go and explain it to them. So a makerspace is a community in a physical place where the people with common interests get together and talk about similar topics like programming, hardware hacking, um, 
they, there's usually a machine shop element, so people come together in the community and build things in a, in a shop with tools, with their lathe, with their soldering irons, whatever, whatever they want to make. And it's a, it's a pretty cool place to be socialized about um, anything that they're passionate about. All right, uh, so High Capacity is, is a baby. Uh, we started uh, in March 2011, so this year we've, we've been in existence for nine months only. And in, um, someone posted on TechCui on the forum, so it's appropriate that I'm here talking about High Capacity at the TechCui conference. Um, so, my name is Scott, and I'm going to talk to you about the Global Game Jam. The Global Game Jam is kind of like a hackathon or startup weekend, but its focus is on making video game prototypes. It's also a global event, so in 2011, we had 6,500 people in 44 countries and 159 locations who made over 1,500 games in just one weekend. So I thought that was pretty amazing. So the three main tenets of the Global Game Jam is innovation, experimentation, and collaboration. We're really big on innovating and our community. So uh, here's a few hellos from some of our international organizers. Actually from the East Coast. Anybody here from the East Coast? <laughs> what part? Jersey. Jersey? Oh, I'm, I'm from Wyman Island. <laughs> Other East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm actually with, with Thana Boy. We're a nonprofit organization, grassroots group. We got started about three years ago formally. It was really just a bunch of friends getting together, talking story, and being really bothered by the state of things in Hawaii. We were worried about where things were going, and we wanted to make a really big change. Just at night, people across the entire state. This is a picture from one of the early organizing uh, sessions. And so we want to get thousands of residents involved in food, waste, compassion, and energy. How do you get thousands of people involved? And we knew we needed technology. So we built a whole bunch of different sites. You can see here, uh, we tried um, hundreds of different features and, and this and that, and we ended up with two specific features that we built that ended up becoming a platform that we ultimately sold. And those two features, one is that we built a commitment-centric approach to social networking. My name is Nicole Corey, and I'm here to talk to you today about Rediscovered Technology. Uh, there's a lot of things out there that have been thought of before, which can be frustrating if you go to USPTO.gov and you've got a great idea that it turns out someone's already patented. But there's also wonderful things we can learn from the past. I've been taking a lithography class at the academy school, and we're literally drawing pictures on slabs of rock and putting that stone on the press to print pictures from it. It's a technology that was invented uh, in the 1700s, and it's amazing to see how much better the pictures looked when it was being used as a commercial printing technique. Um, and, you know, my classmates will bring things that they've collected in. So it made me think, maybe there's other things out there that we can learn from the classroom. This is the antiquated advice. It was pulled up from the ocean off the coast of Greece in 1902, first x-rayed in 1971. The conference was organized by the University of Hawaii Pacific New Media, Ikezo, Ignite Honolulu, High Capacity, IGDA, Honolulu Chapter, and ThinkTech. The first Ignite at the Box Jelly was geared towards bringing designers and developers on the island together because, um, you know, it's, it's necessary for designers and developers to meet and to work together with the whole front and back end relationship with, um, with projects, but it's such a, such a niche with each other, like they only seem to hang out with each other. It's really hard for them to get together and um, but for a lot of these like projects, personal projects, or a lot of startups, it's really important that these circles meet and interact with each other. So that was the purpose for the first Ignite. And the Box Jelly was the perfect venue for it because it's a co-working space. Um, the second one was at the Tech Hui conference, and this was geared towards the tech industry only. So, and the way the Tech Hui conference is set up is it's a day-long event. Um, with different sessions throughout the day. And so we were the third session um, in the, at University of Hawaii Manoa, and we were in the art auditorium. And we had a total of, what was it? It was nine, eight speakers with um, Kevin Hughes doing a karaoke at the end. Um, and for the karaoke, what that is, is basically we give you an Ignite present, someone else's Ignite presentation and you've never seen it before, you don't know what it is, and you have to wing it. Which is kind of like, it brings like this entertainment um, aspect to the program. And Ignite, um, by nature, isn't supposed to be taken 
too too seriously. I mean, in different cities, you'll see that they you know they rent out auditoriums and halls and theaters, um, but traditionally, ignite is supposed to happen at a bar or an event where it's a more casual um, way of presenting what you're passionate about. But it is important because it's recorded, and it is important because it's a stage where individuals can speak about what they care about, which is like this huge movement that's coming in with a lot of co-working spaces and just a whole millennial generation where um, they're more about doing what they love for a living and being you know, a part of startups, being entrepreneurs or whatever, being freelancers. Um, and the reason why Ignite exists and why it's important to bring it to Honolulu is so that we can nurture that kind of community here as well. Um, the company that started Ignite um, in Seattle is a tech company, and it does speak to a lot of um, techies, partially because techies are very passionate. Um, they're a very passionate group, and they have a lot of, um, like, they're so intelligent, and they, you know, they, they, when you love something, you naturally tend to research what you care about. And Ignite is great because it's super short. And um, it's kind of like this thing where um, you get so much information and you get entertained um, and you're not bored because the presentations are only five minutes long. And I've been really fortunate to have very incredible speakers um, be a part of Ignite. Um, last time at Tekui, we had like, Kevin Hughes, which, who's amazing, one of the top, one of the only people on the World Wide Web Hall of Fame. I'm not exactly sure, but there's only like, um, there's only like nine people on that list, and he's from Hawaii. It's amazing, you know. So it it really, I mean, I was I was born here. I wasn't raised here, um, but I want to stay here. And I get really bummed when I hear about people that are good in Hawaii at what they do, and they'll leave because they feel like there's no industry for them here. And I believe that's slowly changing. And hopefully um, with things like Ignite, um, it'll showcase all the talent that we do have here and kind of set an example that, you know, Hawaii can be looked at as, you know, one of the best of what they do or whatever. Because it's really important that, you know, people want to stay here and, and make Hawaii grow. Because it has so much potential. And it's done amazing things already. It's just I don't feel like people really know about it. So through Ignite, it's kind of like a voice and a mic for like inspiration and um, innovation, which I think is just really good for any kind of community. Now for our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech's 4 to 5 p.m. weekday drive time radio series on KGU 760 AM continues this week covering business, Asia, tech, energy, the arts, and government. Tune in to 760 AM every weekday at 4 p.m. and raise your awareness on ThinkTech Radio. On February 26, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will present its annual update on energy celebrating the best deals of the year for energy entrepreneurs in Hawaii. You can sign up for these programs on hvca.org. And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. Hey Bill, what's your Spensation this week? Well Duke, I think we ought to give some credit to Tech Hui. They're going on five years now of being around and they've got a tremendous community of tech entrepreneurs and software developers and CG artists uh, 
you name it. They've really brought together uh, a great group of people and engaged them in activities like the conference. You know, what a great way to get introduced to uh, a whole bunch of your peers in an exciting forum with lots of information and networking. I think they're doing a great job. Bill, what does this mean for the tech industry and our hopes for growing it in Hawaii? Well, number one, I, I think it proves that there is life in tech in Hawaii. Uh, you can't bring together this many people with those kinds of skills and not show that Hawaii is really on the map when it comes to tech. And I think uh, Dan Luke has done a fantastic job organizing this group, and I think this conference was a great example of how our tech community really is collaborative, working together, and helping raise the state of tech in Hawaii. And here's our co-working entrepreneurs, Ray Chung, Fujihira, and Tony Stanford, to keep us current on their latest adventures at the Box Jelly. They were instrumental in setting up the Ignite segment of the Tech Hui Conference. Jelly Week. It was a complete success in many ways, was it not? It was good. Uh, from Monday through Friday, we had uh, event after event after event. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about each event. We, we managed to start really strong and end even stronger, which is what I love to see. Yeah. Monday. Uh, Monday was a complete success. We had uh, both Bill Spencer from Hawaii Venture Capital Association come down and uh, talk with John Watkins, an uh, up-and-coming young entrepreneur, and they both gave their um, uh, vision of uh, the role that fear plays and getting beyond, beyond fear uh, as an entrepreneur. So it was a really good uh, event, really great turnout. Um, afterwards, the community was lit up. It was. It, what was magical at the end was the Q&A afterwards that followed was something great. It was everyone started throwing out their big ideas. People across the room were, and experts in that field saying they would help. And the community really started running with itself. And that's the time when we just need to step aside and watch them run. So we, you know, we're doing we're doing something right. Definitely, definitely. On uh, Wednesday we had a private event. The private event went really well as uh, as well. They were happy. We got a lot of good feedback. Excellent feedback. Excellent feedback. So we'll be doing more of those uh, events in the near future, most likely. Uh, Thursday, high capacity. They came down in full force. Um, the, the room was packed. I had to literally go out and get extra tables to accommodate everyone. It was great. Afterwards, everyone was preparing for the hackathon. They got into their own groups, started working right away. And again, another instance of watching the community work together and start running with themselves. It was just, it was another point where we just stepped on the side and was like, wow. Mm -hmm. And on Friday, we're doing new things. You want to? New things. We we had a, a special uh, special event down where yeah. we had um, an artist that came down, played acoustic guitar. We had a nautical theme behind it, and it was really fun. Uh -huh. It was a new venue that we explored, and it's something that I think we need to take further. Yes, uh, and we will be. So we're working with our very first customer, Ed Organic from Organic Clothing, and uh, we're doing a mini concert series. And it's perfect for us because on Fridays, our space is very underutilized. So being able to um, kind of convert in, let, let our community kind of uh, mm, relax together um, is also a nice Come thing Come in, do. unwind, and it was just, so, I, I got approached by six different people saying this is the best thing they've seen all year. Yeah, so it, 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 was, it was nice. It, and it's something that we're definitely going to look to work with in our next new space. All right. Um, we have a few key takeaways. Uh, for us, it was, it was very difficult because we had never done like five events back to back in a row. So, with a um, two-man team. With a two-man two team. Two-man team. Yeah, so it, it was really stressful. We had three weeks to prepare and we worked really hard. Um, we didn't hit all the marks we wanted to, but um, we hit enough of them where I can feel that we really accomplished something uh, towards our goals. As an overall, I want to say it was a success. Good job. Thank you. Thank me. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Scheidler Foundling Foundation. It supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including ThinkTech. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, 
tech company in Hawaii. Oceanen, another local tech company, is one of Hawaii's largest and most diversified science and engineering companies. And don't forget ThinkTech. Please help us out by making a contribution on thinktechhawaii.com. Thank you so much. Now let's take a moment to meet our newest ThinkTech volunteer, Chrissy Goffigan. I'm a senior over at HPU, finishing up my last semester. Um, I'm currently the arts and entertainment editor over there at the newspaper. And ThinkTech is one of my internships I'll, I've included as part of my uh, schedule for this coming semester. As of right now, I'm updating the current mailing list for Think Tech. I'm helping wherever I can, um, behind the scenes, in the luncheons, whatever uh, Jay needs help with, I'm there. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to pitch some ideas and possibly produce some segments. I kind of came on board as uh, for an opportunity to co-host a radio segment, and then from there, the not the idea of being on air, but behind the scenes and the work that goes into it kind of interested me. So I asked you if I can come on board and you said yes. So here I am. Originally I was gung-ho about broadcast and that's what I wanted to do. Within the past year I've kind of had a change of heart. Now I, I really like print and then I've been introduced to production segment. So Specifically, I do know I want to do something that impacts the people, addresses concerns they might have, go into detail about it, and make a difference in that sense. But as far as how I'm going to do it, there's so many different um, opportunities and ways to do it. So hopefully by the end of this semester, I'll just have a more focused uh, direction in that sense. This is only the beginning of great things. Okay, Bill. That wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it just like Jay Fidel does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Duke. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a sponsor or a volunteer and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. Thanks for joining us on ThinkTech. Aloha, everyone. I'm Bill Spencer. See you next time. Mm -hmm.